skin. I don't like you. No, that's not it. I need to write you some concerns. I remember at a church camp, a youth minister had juniors and seniors in high school get together for a confession activity. I took a piece of paper and wrote down sin. I crumbled up the paper, I threw it in the soon-to-be-lit fire. So when it was dark, the youth minister lit the fire, and then he said, Jesus forgives, go and sin no more. As the smoke and ashes began to rise in the air, I could not find my own sin in the smoke. So I held my breath, hoping not to inhale the fumes of sin. But you already know this. A few days later, I had sinned again. Sin, you are supposed to teach me right from wrong. But instead, at times, I feel that I am morally superior or that I think I'm better than others. Some would argue that I'm soft on you, accused of a slippery slope, that I am contributing to a fairy tale world filled with unicorns where any person can act as bad as they want and they can still get to heaven. Sin, if I'm honest, at times I feel that God has expectations that are impossible to meet. I mean, let's face it, you are a very long list. Don't smoke, don't swear, don't be greedy, sexual impurities, don't make out with your boyfriend or girlfriend, don't watch bad movies, don't be negative, wear modest clothes, don't be rude, do right, in the right way, at the right time. This is exhausting. How am I to describe you? Are you merely bad behavior and poor choices? Are you found in the wind and waters during the hurricane? Where are you in governments? Are you found in my clothes, stitched in harsh conditions? Which types of people would you call sinful? Are you other religions? Are you in my religion? What's your relation to disease and freak accidents anyways? How big are you in this world? Maybe how hidden are you in my own life? Sincerely yours, no, least regards, Mick. Good morning. As I was driving this morning, I'm away to to be with my church family. I happened upon this letter from Facebook, a friend of mine. And uh, he says this, I am a Christian. I want you to know that my belief in Jesus doesn't make me superior to anyone else. And if I've ever made anyone feel that way, I apologize. I follow Jesus who perfectly demonstrated what it is what it is to love God and to love others. Because I'm a Christian, I want you to know that whatever your beliefs, you have permission to hold me accountable to the teachings of Jesus. Uh, this last year, uh, this movie, Trolls, came out. And it's, I'll, I'll be honest, it's probably one of my favorite movies that I watched this year. And it's a story about the trolls who are this happy, kind of um, really nice group of trolls. And unfortunately, though, there is the antagonist who are the Bergens. And the Bergens are these dark, evil, grumpy giants who like to eat the trolls. Now, the reason why they like to eat the trolls, to be fair to them, is they want a bite of the happiness that the trolls have. So once a year, they make this big holiday whoop de doo deal where they try to grab these trolls and eat them, and they make themselves feel better, right? Well, there are two main characters in this movie, Trolls. One is Poppy, who's the girl, and she is almost annoyingly happy, right? She's like the so happy person that you're like, oh, is there something wrong with you because you're so happy, right? And then the other is Branch. And, well, as you can see, Branch is a curmudgeon, as Jason West, it's a Jason West word, he is grumpy. And so Branch thought the best way to avoid the Bergens was for him to isolate himself, to hide himself from people in general. He thought, if I remove myself from this deadly evil situation, then I will be better for it. 
But what happened was, was because of that isolation, he actually became kind of like the Bergens. He became unhappy. I don't want to ruin the movie for you, but there's this journey with Poppy and Branch that they go off to rescue their friends who once again get captured by the Bergens. They're about to be, um, you know, they... Am I allowed to say is, I don't know if kids this is appropriate, but giants are eating b- trolls. Um, so sorry, I didn't think about that. Um, so they're about to stop the Bergens. And how do they win is the question. And I'm not ruining it for you. you got to go see it. By showing happiness. By showing fulfillment. By showing joy. And the way they do this is through singing. Through song. So I'm going to be that dad who's going to be embarrassing someday to his kids, but right now, Jordan thinks this is cool. I got this feeling inside my bones. It goes electric wavy when I turn it on. And if you want it inside your soul, just open up your heart and let it take control. I got that sunshine in my pocket, got that good soul in my feet. Heard that song? If you haven't yet, get out and go listen to it. Oh, yeah, it's not, it's not on the, the church songs this yeah. Good thing I didn't start singing the high note. I got that feeling. Right, so that's embarrassing. That's when things get terrible. Okay. Paul at the end of chapter 5. Here we go. After this long section on sin, has a similar response. He's got this feeling inside his bones, that the counter of sin and evil is to sing psalms, is to sing spiritual songs, it's to make melody in your hearts. Make melody in your hearts. Like me, if you grew up in churches of Christ, um, I find it sadly ironic that people used this passage of Ephesians 19 through 20 as a way to support their claims of positions in worship arguments to create division. This passage is not at all for that. In fact, it's opposite. This passage is about God's people's response to being filled with the Spirit. And being filled with the Spirit, you sing out. You sing with your hearts. And that is the best way to attack sin. That is the best way to attack division. I mean, think about it. You can sing in your closet, but it's kind of weird, right? If you just kind of put yourself in the closet and sing to yourself. I mean, I've told you this before, but I'm a shower singer. And so even when I sing in the shower, my whole household hears it, right? So when I turn on the radio and I'm driving down the road and I'm singing, you know, a Justin Timberlake song, people drive up to me, look at me and go, that's weird right? And I'm like, yeah, right? Come on, sing with me, right? Uh, Little Woman uh, show just uh, this week. uh, Malpies and Hyman Girls participate in that. It's a musical. They're singing, right? The point of singing is you do so in the context of community. You do so with people around you, right? That's, That's the purpose of this. You don't do it by yourself. You don't isolate yourself, the first two sins of scripture you found in, in Genesis, early in Genesis, is the story of Adam and Eve and the story of Cain and Abel, right? Each of these stories reveal a deep tragedy and the consequences of sin. Arguably, the worst, the worst thing that Adam and Eve did was not eating from the tree, but it was their response to their disobedience. They hid and removed themselves from the presence of God. They were ashamed. Cain and Abel, another tragic story, was a sin where Cain destroyed the life, literally, of Abel, only because he wanted to preserve himself. You see, I find many Christians today take on the branch troll's position of sin, 
where they try to name the problem themselves and then they think they can fix it themselves. That there's no need for community and the result is isolation. The result is removing ourselves. And if it's not that, then the other is, is the church takes on this hard edge to a sin where they name it in such mean ways that the people who actually suffer from it, they isolate themselves. They hide themselves. And they are ashamed. And because of the church and its response, how do you respond to it, right? How do you participate in a church? I mean, let's, let's just, well, well, Paul brings up a uh, filling of wine. Let's truly say that there are those within here that are struggling with addiction of alcoholism. And what if our church family, in all its language, talked about how disgusting or how disturbing or how awful or how you name it and how could anybody do that and how, how why, why, that is so worldly and ungodly. And then maybe that person in the pew who's struggling with it goes, I struggle with it. Am I allowed to share that? Or am I ungodly? Or am I disgusting? And so they cower. They hide. They find themselves deeper in the bush, hidden away from the presence of God. Let's look at what Paul is doing. Going through this long select section of chapter 4, 17 through 520, you notice that when sin is mentioned, that it's done so where there's this form of writing called dualism. And you notice that on the video, you would see one side spoken, so you would see lies or truth, uh, thief or giving. Well, the main themes, right, is, is more like this. There's old, and then there's new. There is dark, and then there is light, right? You're getting this. There is foolish, and then there is wise. There is weak, and then there is mick. I'm just kidding. That was, that was terrible, right? So... This is actually great baptism theology. Think about it when you're baptized, right? So, uh, and even Paul uses, this is a great text for baptism, when you clothe yourself. So when you clothe yourself, you die to your old self. You're buried in water, and then now you are raised again into newness, and now you are clothed in Jesus Christ, right? That's good stuff. And so... As far as the old, though, this side over here, not this side of the church, but this side is over here, old and dark and foolishness are concerned, there's a variety of sins, and you'll see that, that Paul lists them, and they're not just listed in Ephesians. You see there's like, for example, in Galatians, there's the works of the flesh versus the works of the Spirit. So we see these ongoing lists throughout Scripture. And the kind of the three big ones that are main themes throughout this passage are... Greed, sexual immorality, and that nasty, bad tongue. Okay? So when you think of nasty, bad tongue, let's think slandering, talking bad about others, lying, things like that. So Paul is very harsh about these sins. He says, don't be like the Gentiles. He says, they are darkened in their understanding. They are alienated from the life of God. And because of their ignorance, they have a hardness of heart. Also says in chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Be sure of this, that no fornicator, no impure person, or one who is greedy, that is an adulterer, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So, so let's think about the bigger picture with sins like greed, sexual immorality, and that nasty, bad tongue. These are sins like so many others that are about the self, right? It's self-fulfillment, right? That's essentially what sin is about. It's 
how do I fill myself up? There's an emptiness, and I need to fill it up. So, for example, there is nothing wrong with growing a Roth IRA, right? I know Roger is a financial guy. We've got other guys here, so there's nothing wrong with that. But to make money at the expense of others, that's wrong. Paul targets sexual immorality because it is so selfish, and it often destroys the physical, the emotional, and the mental life of other people. That slandering, nasty mouth, it belittles and strips people of their dignity. I mean, let's face it, our society profits at the expense of others. Um, Let's take human trafficking as an example. Human slavery is at an all-time high in all of the history, in all of the world, when it comes to slavery. There are so many great nonprofits out there that I know of that, are, that you can support that are tackling and fighting this very, very difficult situation. A study was published at the end of January this year in the Houston Chronicle, and the research said that an estimated 313 humans were trafficked in Texas alone, that over 200,000 are minors. And there were only 128 convictions. This is in Texas. This is our backyard. These are our neighbors. This is our community. These are our friends. And I am very uncomfortable with these stats. Paul says fornication and impurity of any kind or greed must not even be mentioned among you as proper among the saints. So here is what Ephesians is doing. How about this? How about churches take a proactive approach on how to live in a world that is filled with sin? For example, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul describes gifts that people have given by God. See, the challenge is for churches to invite all types of people to use their gifts. Artists, singers, musicians, teachers, athletes, writers, those who are good hosts and hostesses. See, our gifts, what God has called us into, that's our opportunity. That is our opportunity to pour out and to show the world how God has revealed himself in each of us. See, Ephesians is suggesting that mature faith is not about removing stuff out of our lives. It's not about taking things out, like sin, but it's about filling ourselves. And Jake did a fantastic job with the communion, filling ourselves with the Spirit of God, so much so that it's poured out into the world, a world filled with hatred, violence, division, and suffering. See, we are mistaken. If this simple formula up here Life minus sin is going to make us happy. See, the danger is, as I mentioned even in my letter, if you heard it, was that we take on this moral superior ground as if we are better than others. As if my constant sinning life is less of an issue than your constant sinning life. Please hear me. I'm not saying live a dual life. I'm not saying, hey, it's cool to live in the old life, but also in the new, right? One foot in, one foot out. I'm not saying you can be both dark and you can be light. I'm not saying that you can be foolish and you can be wise. Paul is saying that churches, communities of faith, are called to action in abundance. But not the abundance of sin, right? but the abundance of God's filling, of God's spirit that overflows. So that's why you hear passages like, clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. 
That's why you hear Paul say, imitate God like dearly loved children. Live your life with love. Follow the example of Jesus. Jesus, who loved us, who gave himself up for us. He was a sacrificial offering that smelled sweet to God. Don't get drunk on wine, for that's debauchery. Be filled with the Spirit of God. But we let shame take over. We hide ourselves from God, from ministry, from practicing church. I'm not good enough. I'm ashamed of who I am. I can't deal with this. I don't even know how to ask for help. Or opposite, I don't need help. I'm good. I'm fixed. I'm all right. In fact, how dare you preach your big talk about my sin? You should be talking about the sin of others. And so we let shame take over. And folks, there is way too much shame in our world today. And so we scramble and we pursue pay raises. We think more and more relationships, especially unhealthy ones, is going to make it better. We love trophies and accomplishments. We go on vacations seeking ways to fill our lives. We drink, we lust, we desire, we want more money, better looks, retirement. And we do this and do this and do this, and we still realize at the end of the day, this is not filling at all. And like I said, shame takes over. We hide ourselves from God, neglecting that true fulfillment comes from being in the presence of God. To be in God's presence means to be filled with God's Spirit. And so, a simple step this morning, this is it, a simple step in combating sin is for me to let Christians, for all of you, know this. You have nothing to be ashamed about. I feel like I could just grab you each and look in your eyes and say to you, you have nothing to be ashamed about. You are filled with a God that loves you. God will meet you where you are and God will transform you by the power of Jesus Christ. And no matter where you are, God will find space in your soul, even if you feel your soul is ashamed, ashamed and even if your soul is destroying the lives of others, God will find space where the Spirit can begin to fill you. That's the fulfilled life. And, and here's the thing. On this journey, something really incredible happens. Your imperfect self becomes a ministry to others. That you have an opportunity to bless others. Because as you empty yourself of sin... You begin to overflow with the Spirit of God. And the result is Spirit filling or Spirit spilling. It never fails when my family goes to the restaurant that somebody is going to spill a drink. Okay? I hope this doesn't happen to you. So let's say I lean across the table and I accidentally knock down my son's filled water because, it, you know, and so he, and it spills everywhere. When that happens in a restaurant, if you have the instinct, what do you do? <sighs> right? You push out and away, and you hope that whatever just spilled does not get on you. Well, I don't have those reactive skills. 
So anytime I or somebody at the table spills, I usually have it all over me, right? Pray for God's spirit to fill you up where it just spills over everybody else in your life. Pray for the spirit of God in others to spill on you. Pray that the spirit in you can feel others. See, this is the type of life that is filling. This is what Paul is trying to suggest. And it's in this that the church responds in worship and in song. So Paul says to his church, I got this feeling. And as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, sing and make melody to the Lord in your hearts. In your hearts that is spilling over to give thanks to the God, the Father, at all times. For everything we do is in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all of God's people say,